Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kayvon Karazian with the Demand Progress Education Fund. Thank you so much for joining us today for part one in our three-part series, Understanding the National Security Reforms and Accountability Act, produced by ACT-TV. In this first part, we'll be looking at the reforms proposed in the legislation related to war powers. To start things off, we'll hear from the bill's co-leads, Representative McGovern of Massachusetts and Representative Meyer of Michigan. First, we'll hear from Representative McGovern, Representative, thank you so much for joining us today. The virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you, Kevon, and um, thanks for the introduction. And I especially want to thank Demand Progress um, and the Open Society Foundation for hosting this very important forum. But please let me begin by thanking each and every one of you, uh, each of your organizations uh, and the powerful coalition that you created ha have held together for more than two and a half years. Uh, and this legislation that we're going to talk about today would never have been possible would never have happened without all of you. Uh, and if it had come out in bits and pieces or with competing bills, it would never have been uh, of this quality. And while my friend and colleague, Representative Peter Meyer, and I will get credit for introducing HR 5410, along with our bipartisan colleagues, Representative Joaquin Castro, Barbara Lee, Cynthia Mace, Peter DeFazio, and Ted Liu, uh, we all know that the real credit belongs to uh, many of you on this uh, on this call. Uh, you know, it's been a long journey since Mort Halpern first sat down with my legislative director, Cindy Buell, uh, about an idea that you'd all been working on. And like many plans, it was slowed down and often put on hold during the first several months of the COVID pandemic. And when we were able to give it the attention and focus it merited, we engaged not only in a series of consultations with many of you directly, but also with our colleagues on the Hill. Such long and careful, thoughtful and difficult investment in time and effort, however, has paid off in a remarkable bill that reflects a bipartisan consensus that crosses many political and ideological lines for long overdue national security reforms. And so I hope that you all take pride in your essential contributions to this process and to the final legislation uh, as introduced. So in his videotape remarks, which will follow me, uh, Peter gives an excellent summary of the substance of the National Security Reforms and Accountability Act, um, as we can uh, call as we call the bill in, in, in the House. So I'm not going to repeat what he is going to uh, say to all of you uh, and, and repeat what he describes. I would, however, like to take a couple of minutes to describe why this bill is so necessary. As you know, uh, I'm the chairman of the House Rules Committee. And that committee has already held two hearings that laid out the basis and need for this bill. The first in March 2020, scarcely two weeks before Congress uh, was locked down in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that, that, that hearing looked at the big picture, the overreaching need for reform. The second hearing that took place almost a year later in March of 2021 focused on why Congress needed reforms to the War Powers Resolution. That second hearing was also done in coordination with the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Each of these hearings has bipartisan support and blessings. And in the Rules Committee, each took place with incredibly civil and bipartisan engagement. I credit uh, the interest and engagement of my good friend and ranking member of the Rules Committee, Tom Cole of Oklahoma, uh, for much of that. But it also demonstrates how even in these rancorous and divisive times, members of Congress can come together across the aisle and do really good work together. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, it's going to take a great deal of work on the part of the NGO community in all its political and philosophical diversity to help advance this bill through the legislative process. As you know, H.R. 5410 has been referred to three committees for further action and consideration. The House Foreign Affairs Committee with jurisdiction over the war powers and arms export reforms, the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee for National Emergency Reforms, and the House Rules Committee with jurisdiction over everything, all of these titles. Um, so uh, you have your work cut out for you, just as we do uh, on the Hill. Now, let me conclude with a couple of observations. Um, many people on and off the Hill describe the need for these reforms as rebalancing the powers between the executive and legislative branches of government of restoring Congress's constitutional powers over matters of war and peace and other national security sectors, uh, of stopping or placing limits on executive overreach. I know all, all of that is, is true. But these reforms are very much needed because Congress 
has ceded its authority and its constitutional duties to the executive. Congress failed to act time and time again, especially on the difficult questions of war and peace. It didn't matter who was in the White House or which party controlled the majority in the House or Senate. We in Congress gave away our powers, shrank away from our responsibilities, and the price was paid by our uniformed men and women and all the American people. Members of Congress uh, don't like to take tough votes. I hate to admit it, but I think that's a, that's a reality. In fact, uh, oftentimes we work like hell to avoid them. Many members of Congress prefer to sit on the sidelines and bitch about the White House or, or the other party. It's a lot more comfortable, in fact. It's a lot more fun. This has been especially true on matters of war and peace. But that's what we're elected to do. We're supposed to make the tough choices and take the hard votes. So H.R. 5410 not only restores balance between the executive branch and Congress, it forces Congress to step up uh, to the plate and take one hard vote after another. It requires Congress to create a new comfort zone by learning to live with uncomfortable votes and their consequences. And it requires every member of Congress to take their oath of office seriously. And I'm proud of that. So, and I hope that you're proud of the fact that you're pushing the Congress to live up to its constitutional mandate, especially in matters of war and peace and the national security interests of the American people. And I look forward to working with you uh, again as chairman of the rules committee uh, to help uh, uh, push for more hearings uh, and more legislative action through the committees onto the House floor, and then uh, the same in the Senate. But again, uh, thank you very much for all of your work uh, on this, and, um, and then we're going to get this done. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you for those words, Representative, and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Now we will turn to Representative Meyer, who has provided pre-recorded remarks for the event. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Meyer, and I represent Michigan's third congressional district in the House of Representatives. I want to thank the Demand Progress Education Fund for hosting these great panel discussions. I've been working on legislation to reassert congressional authority over war powers since before I was elected. I'm excited to discuss the bill we have before us, and I'm even more excited to see it progress through the legislative process. On September 30th, Representative James McGovern of Massachusetts and myself introduced the National Security Reforms and Accountability Act, or the NSRAA. On the other side of the Capitol, Senators Chris Murphy, Bernie Sanders, and Mike Lee introduced a companion bill with some slight differences. The bipartisan nature of these bills in both chambers, so bicameral as well, highlights that this is not a partisan issue, but one of a constitutional question. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution specifically gives Congress, and Congress alone, the responsibilities of declaring war, raising and supporting armies, and deciding when our military will be employed in the service of the United States. Over time, the executive branch has gradually usurped military responsibilities with little pushback from Congress or the American people. Exceptions that were made in times of unprecedented foreign aggression have now become the status quo for how we engage in conflicts around the world. Deciding whether to enter a military conflict, either through troops on the ground or the sale of military weapons, is a multifaceted decision that deserves consideration by more than just one branch of government. In 1950, President Truman and his administration decided to involve U.S. troops in the Korean War. This marked the first time our troops engaged in a serious military conflict without congressional approval. Since then, all U.S. military involvements have taken place without a congressional declaration of war. Allowing administration after administration, presidents on both sides of the aisle, to supersede Congress's authority over matters of war and peace is a dereliction of responsibility. The National Security Reforms and Accountability Act will put Congress back in the driver's seat to perform the duties we are assigned in the Constitution. The legislation has three parts, war powers reform, arms export reform, and national emergencies reform. And they are all unified by a set of rules and procedures that reassert and safeguard congressional prerogatives. In each case, the president is required to consult congressional leaders and obtain explicit congressional authorization before exercising the powers in question. This is not the first time that Congress has attempted to take back the reins on war powers. In 1973, 18 years into the Vietnam War, 
Congress passed the War Powers Resolution to reassert its power over war declarations. The resolution required the president to notify Congress within 48 hours of committing U.S. troops to military action and to set a 60-day limit of troop deployments if congressional authorization is not achieved. Unfortunately, the War Powers Resolution has proven widely ineffective at curbing presidential power. It has been ignored by presidents and circumvented with authorizations for the use of military force, or AUMFs, and claims of just limited military engagement. A shortcoming of the resolution is its failure to define key terms, allowing for varied interpretations by past administrations. The NSRAA defines these terms that previously created ambiguity and defines them explicitly. Additionally, our bill shortens the timeline for troop deployments without congressional authorization from 60 days to 20 days. After those 20 days, funding will automatically be cut off if Congress has not issued a declaration of war or an authorization for the use of military force. The legislation also outlines specific requirements that Congress can use to guide future discussions on AUMFs. The National Security Reforms and Accountability Act will not just reform the authorization use of military force, but also the authorization of arms sales, which have all too often been a backdoor into our engagement in conflicts. The lack of congressional oversight in this form of military involvement is a serious violation of our established checks and balances. Presently, arms sales are the most common way we engage in war, but under current law, all arms sales are approved automatically. For Congress to block an arms sale, both chambers must pass a resolution with veto-proof majorities. The NSRA simply requires Congress to affirmatively authorize foreign military sales and direct commercial sales of the most destructive and potentially destabilizing weapons. Our bill gives Congress authorization powers over all arms sales that reach a certain monetary threshold. Lastly, the bill aims to reform national emergency declarations. For decades, administrations from both parties have used national emergencies as a way of increasing executive power. The NSRAA restricts the president's utilization of emergency powers to powers directly related to the emergency declaration and the specific emergency powers have to be approved by Congress within 30 days. So there's still the ability of a president to react, but Congress has a say. Finally, the bill will end permanent emergencies. There are currently 39 active emergency declarations, some of which go back to the 1970s. This legislation requires congressional approval for any emergencies being renewed after one year and imposes a five-year total limit on states of emergency. While the legislation rightfully returns war powers to Congress, it does not impede the president's ability to act quickly and decisively in times of question, crisis. The NSRAA guarantees Congress has a legislative role in any ongoing military actions and emergency responses. It ensures actions carried out by the executive branch in urgent situations are subject to congressional guidelines and authorization. History, and especially our recent history, has shown us the necessity of these reforms. The executive branch has been able to act unilaterally on these matters for far too long, and when American lives are at stake, Congress must have a seat on the table. Congress is the most responsive body to the people. It can have a referendum on its decisions near you know, every two years, but at the same time is accountable to the voters in frankly ways the president is not. National emergencies and military conflicts are not an excuse to suspend the constitutional delegation of powers. Times of distress are when the separations of power and our checks and balances are at their most crucial. I'm glad to help lead this critical an important effort in the House, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. Big thank you to Representative Meyer for sending that in and teeing up our conversation for today. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it to our moderator for today, Erica Fine, who serves as the Senior Washington Director at Win Without War. Erica, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Kayvon. Thank you to Demand Progress for hosting this event. And thank you to Congressman Meyer and Congressman McGovern for um, their remarks and for spearheading this legislation. Um, it's really wonderful to see the bipartisan um, nature of this effort come together. And um, without further ado, let's begin the panel. So I am really honored to be the moderator with our esteemed panelists to talk about the war powers part of the National Security Reforms and Accountability Act, 
as it's known in the House and the National Security Powers Act, as it's known in the Senate. Legislation that my own organization, Win Without War, very proudly supports. So to set the stage for this conversation, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a run of show um, as we've got a long introduction, but we're, we're going to try and make this um, a bit more conversational. So we're going to begin in two parts, talking first about the major policy, legislative, legal, and on the ground problems with the current war powers framework. And then we'll turn to more closely examine the legislation and dig into the rationale for Congress's involvement in war powers in the first place, which after decades of an ever expanding executive branch may not always be so obvious. Before we get to questions, we're going to, uh, I'm going to give abridged bios for um, the first two panelists. And um, if you're interested in learning more about them, you should look them up online and really, and, and I actually highly recommend you doing that. But um, we're going to turn first to um, Steve Pomper, who is the Interim Chief of Policy at the International Crisis Group. Prior to joining the Crisis Group, Steve served in the National Security Council and at the State Department in various roles, including uh, most recently as the Special Assistant to, President, um, to the President and Senior Director for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights under President Obama. And then we'll next turn to Hina Shamsi, who is the director of the National Security Project at the American Civil Liberties Union, which is dedicated to ensuring that the US national security policies and practices are consistent with the constitution, civil liberties, and human rights. She previously worked as a staff attorney at the ACLU National Security Project and was acting director of Human Rights First Law and Security Program. She also served as a senior advisor to the UN Special Rapporteur on extrajudicial, extrajudicial summary and arbitrary executions and is a lecturer in law at Columbia University Law School. So again, I'm gonna ask um, the questions in succession to both Steve and then Henna, and then I will open it up to the two of you for um, answers in, in sort of a more conversational form. So. To begin, um, to Steve, despite the Constitution's clear mandate that Congress has the sole authority to declare war, the president has for years argued that it has legal authority to take military action essentially any time um, it, it desires around the world with absolutely devastating consequences for people around the world. How did we get here? And then, uh, to, to Hina, really, um, really quickly, to Hina, you've been in, um, you've been working on war powers at the ACLU for um, several decades. What's it like to work within this broken framework? Over to you, Steve. Okay, well, Erica, let me start by saying thank you to you um, to demand progress for hosting this panel um, uh, to uh, Congressman Meyer and Congressman McGovern for their words today, but also their just amazing leadership uh, on this legislation, which is of such uh, pressing urgency, and the bipartisan group uh, who have supported them, and also this companion bill in the Senate. Um, and of course, it's wonderful to be here with um, former colleagues and friends and just this amazing panel. Um, on the how did we get here question, well, I think we got here um, exactly uh, through the means that, you know, I think both uh, Congressman McGovern and Congressman Meyer laid out. Uh, we've seen an erosion over time of the checks and balances that the Constitution created to prevent the United States from slipping into imprudent wars. Um, and also the bolsters that Congress has tried to create it over time, tried to create over time to reinforce those safeguards when they started to slip away. Um, when you think about um, the last 50 years, think about how many wars and major military incidents we've seen the U.S. participate in um, that Congress has not uh, specifically authorized. Uh, the so-called tanker wars that squared off the United States against Iran in the Persian Gulf in the late 1980s, the campaign in Kosovo in the 1990s, the campaign against Libya, uh, U.S. participation in the war in Yemen, 
um, the reckless strike against Iranian commander Qasem Soleimani during the Trump administration, aspects of the war on terror that involved groups that didn't even exist when Congress issued its authorization to use military force in 2001. Um, these are all species of the same phenomenon that we're talking about here. And under the Constitution, it really is not supposed to work that way. Article one of the Constitution, as we've all talked about already, um, gives the Congress the, the power to declare war and, and a whole host of associated enumerated powers. And that wasn't an accident. If you go back to the records at the time, uh, this was something the framers thought about. And they wanted this power to live with the US Congress because they knew it was a deliberative body and they knew that it would move more slowly and be less buffeted by political winds into conflict than the executive branch was. So it was very intentional. Now, there was a space that was carved off for the president in uh, his or her Article II capacity as commander in chief to act in defense of the nation, to repel sudden attacks. But that's not where we are right now. What we're talking about right now is living in a world where presidential powers have expanded to the to the extent that basically it's quite easy for the president to enter into an elective war, a non-defensive war without congressional approval. Um, and this expansion has been happening over time. And as you heard in the introductory remarks, you know, it's been become particularly pronounced in the sort of post-World War II era. The Korean War wasn't authorized. Aspects of the Vietnam War weren't authorized by Congress. And in 1973, Congress decided to do something about it. It enacted the War Powers Resolution of 1973, which was and it enacted this over President Nixon's veto, by the way. Um, and it was an effort to try and claw back some of the power that had been lost over the time. And it has lots of interesting features, but I'm going to focus on two in particular, because I think they're particularly relevant to the conflict prevention mission that um, my organization, at least, is, is specifically focused on. Um, one is that uh, the first feature is that it requires the president, it puts a boundary around the length of time the president can uh, conduct a military campaign without congressional approval. It basically requires within 48 hours that the president uh, introduces U.S. forces into hostilities um, that uh, he or she notifies Congress of that introduction. And then within 60 days has to obtain authorization from Congress or withdraw those troops. That 60 days can be extended under cer certain circumstances to 90 days. But the basic idea is Congress has to be notified, and if authorization isn't forthcoming, the troops need to be withdrawn. There's a hole in this provision, however, in that it all hangs on the definition of hostilities, and that definition is not given in the, on the face of the War Powers Resolution. There's some congressional history. Uh, there's a House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, document that suggests that Congress intended to be very broadly construed. Uh, to include situations where confrontation was likely but before any shots had been fired, but that wasn't actually built into the statute. So that was a flaw that uh, we'll come back to in a second. The second key feature of the War Powers Resolution is that it includes a mechanism that allows Congress, by passing a concurrent resolution, to direct the end of a conflict. And a concurrent resolution, is, as, as folks probably know, is a resolution that can be enacted by a majority of both houses of Congress, but doesn't require presidential signature. So you had this boundary provision and you had this uh, enforcement provision or not even an enforcement provision, a provision that allowed Congress to really direct the end of a war if it, if it chose. But over time, those two key provisions have been eroded and they've been eroded through the action or inaction of all three branches of government. I'm going to talk about this very briefly and then hand it back to you. So one of the key, uh, so let me just go by branch by branch. How has the executive branch contributed to the erosion? Well, the executive branch has basically taken it upon itself to articulate and interpret what the War Powers Resolution means. So it has supplied its own definition of this term hostilities, and it has defined it in a very narrow way to involve only situations in which the United States is actually exchanging fire with another armed force. And it's also define the way in which one counts to 60, uh, counts to 60 days uh, under the War Powers Resolution. So that um, there's often a, a sort of difference of views between the executive branch and, and, and critical members of Congress or people on the outside about whether <laughs> the 60 day clock is actually expired. And it's interpreted other terms in its own way as well. And it's also taken a very, um, I would say, aggressive approach to interpreting authorizations that are enacted by Congress. So the 2001 authorization for the use of military force, which was really an authorization to use force against the 9-11 attackers and their harborers, has been interpreted very broadly to apply to groups that didn't even exist in 2001. 
So those are things that the executive branch has done that I think have really eroded the impact of the 1973 framework. The courts have done their own work. Um, two things I'll highlight here. One is a 1983 decision by the Supreme Court uh, in, in the case INS v. Chata, which basically said that in order to have the force of law, an act of Congress has to be passed by both houses of Congress and then signed by the president, um, invalidating what was referred to as the legislative veto. And by most accounts, although there are differences on this, but by most accounts, rendering essentially fatal doubt on the ability of the concurrent resolution mechanism in the war powers resolution to be relied on by Congress to direct an end to conflict. And um, so that's one thing, the concurrent resolution mechanism really sort of lost a lot of uh, ballast in that decision. And then the second thing is the courts have just, you know, through a succession of, of decisions, really stepped away from any kind of meaningful role in enforcing or interpreting the War Powers Resolution. They have all kinds of doctrines saying that, you know, plaintiffs don't have standing to bring suit or that the questions being asked in War Powers cases aren't, uh, are political questions that can't be resolved by a court or they have jurisdictional arguments, but the essential uh, posture of the courts is they don't really want to touch issues under the War Powers Resolution. And then the last, you know, actor and inactor, of course, is Congress itself which has sort of watched the erosion of its uh, of what it had staked out uh, in 1973 and has really done very little um, to push back against it. It you know, occasionally holds an angry hearing or issues a, uh, you know, a nine binding resolution expressing its uh, opinion when a, an, a, an administration does something that it doesn't like in the war and peace space. But it hasn't actually done the kind of work that this bill, the NSRAA, would do uh, to try and actually remedy the situation, at least until now. Um, so that leaves us in a, you know, in a challenging place. Um, it leaves us in a place where 50 years after the War Powers Resolution, um, the 60-day boundary has been eroded. The concurrent resolution mechanism is not reliable. The tests that executive branch lawyers uh, run internally to decide whether or not the United States uh, can go to war are flexible and have been very flexibly applied. It is a system that one constitutional scholar, Jack Goldsmith, has described as one person decides. And that is not the system that the Constitution's framers had in mind. And it's not the system that Congress had in mind in 1973 when it enacted the War Powers Resolution. And I don't think it's a system, if we really stop and think about it, that any of us would want. So I'll turn the floor back to you now. Great, thank you so much, Steve. That really lays out a lot of the issues that we're um, tackling today. And now over to Hina um, to talk more about as a practitioner, what's it like to be have been working um, within this framework over the last 20 years? Thank you so much, Erica. Let me start also with thanks to Demand Progress and to Congressman McGovern and Meyer and to um, uh, an appreciation to join um, so many colleagues who've been working uh, towards pressing reforms for such a long time, including, you know, folks with very diverse views, which I think is very important. So let me start by um, situating this and why the ACLU supports uh, this legislation. We've been, we've been really steadfast for decades, and so for well before my time, um, in insisting on the need for our system of checks and balances uh, in restraining presidential war powers, regardless of which president holds power. We don't, we don't take positions on the political decision to go to war or withdraw troops from it. But what we've always urged is, is strict presidential compliance with the constitution as the framers intended and as the folks who went before me have described. And that's because the, the momentous decision to go to war vests extraordinary powers in the president, which can result in the wartime curtailment of fundamental civil liberties and human rights, like the claimed right to detain people militarily or use lethal force. Um, and those claimed authorities can go over into abuses as we've seen from uh, World War II onwards. And we've got to think about these as, as exceptional powers, wartime powers, that have to be informed by public debate and a congressional vote to ensure that 
not only do they have the endorsement of Congress, but derivatively the American people. And it's critically important for the public at large whose rights and tax dollars are at stake, but also for troops who are asked to, to implement wartime and war-based policies and who want to trust that um, what presidents and lawmakers are asking them to do is lawful and just. And so we've long insisted on compliance um, in vain too often, unfortunately, with uh, a war powers resolution system, but that system in, is broken. And in the last 20 years alone, I think the extent of the breakdown in structural checks and balances has become really starkly clear. We've been in a state of perpetual wars that have exacted a terrible human toll and that continue after the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Our country now has what one study has called a suicide epidemic amongst post 9-11 veterans and active duty military personnel. And here I think it's really important to emphasize what's always been true, but what seems especially apparent and clear now, which is that presidential powers once claimed are hard to claw back, whether by Congress or um, the courts, which have, have as, as Steve mentioned, been, you know, have not engaged in, in this area. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the last 20 years show that unless constraints are imposed, they will continue to expand even beyond their original purpose. And even though they perpetuate human legal and strategic costs. So we've heard mention of the 2001 AUMF, and of course it is the paradigmatic example for our age. Um, and to give you just a very current example from the last you know, couple of weeks, President Biden may have withdrawn troops from Afghanistan, but the 2001 AUMF is still being invoked today to justify indefinite military detention and broken military commissions at Guantanamo, which is recognized around the world and at home as a symbol of injustice and where the United States went wrong, uh, one of the ways in which our country went wrong. Um, and and more broadly, though, you know, the 2001 AUMF has been invoked far beyond its original purpose by presidents, successive presidents, who cited it as the primary legal justification for military operations in multiple parts of the world, far beyond Afghanistan. Um, and in fact, beyond what is recognized as armed conflict under the laws of war, because for almost 20 years, successive presidents have claimed the unilateral power to do something that is very chilling, which is to authorize secretive killing of people who are deemed terrorism suspects, including Americans, even outside recognized battlefields with no min meaningful geographic or temporal limitations, with no meaningful accountability for wrongful deaths and civilian lives lost and injured. And if any other country had this program, our political leaders would rightly be condemning it. Instead, our country is setting a harmful president. Um, these claims of presidential power and just having worked on these issues, you know, these, this approach of military force first as a, as a first resort instead of a last resort hasn't only resulted in wrongful killings of civilians, but contributed to humanitarian crises with Yemen being the paradigmatic tragic example and contributed also to destabilization in fragile states, mass displacement and refugee crisis. A third thing that I think is particularly striking is that presidential claims of power are often laid out by executive branch lawyers in secret legal opinions and guidelines governing the use of lethal force. Um, debates over hostilities, imminent hostilities and other ambiguities in the existing war powers resolution are exploited. And in a country where secret law and policy should be anathema, particularly where lethal force is at issue, it's taken us multiple lawsuits to force disclosure of even the redacted rules. So that brings me, I think, to, to the judiciary, which is where my colleagues and I are often found. Um, Steve referred to Chada and the ways in which it, you know, the concurrent resolution mechanism is now 
um, really unlikely uh, to, to be able to go forward. But I want to just emphasize that courts have limited judicial review in critically important ways and ways that they did not do in earlier eras when we were having these significant war powers debates. Now uh, courts have narrowed standing, the ability to even get inside the courthouse door by legislators and by service members who are seeking to uh, challenge violations of the law, claims of violations of the law. The political question doctrine, the courts have invoked it, the Supreme Court has relied on it more and more, essentially saying, we're staying out of this. This is a political fight between um, Congress and the presidency. So for those who would seek to assert challenges, um, the courts haven't been a, a real meaningful path. And that's partly why we think judicial review provisions, the ability to bring lawsuits is so important in the legislation. But I'll end with this. Um, if checks and balances in our system are to have meaning, surely they need to robustly apply to one of the most momentous decisions our nation can make. Yet we have a system in which what should be a tactic, use of force, lethal force, has become an entire strategy with little or no meaningful accounting for human costs and consequences. It becomes all that much harder to breathe meaningful life into presidential promises of centering diplomacy or address addressing fragility and conflicts abroad, consistent with our values and commitment to rights and liberties, when this is the system we have today. And so we urgently need structural reform of war powers, and that's why the ACLU has supported this legislation. Well, thank you so much to Hina and to Steve. And we're going to turn now to the second part of this of this panel um, with uh, Dr. Tess Bridgman and Will Ruger. And I'm going to introduce them now. Um, but this the beginning of the conversation really tees us up very nicely um, to turn now to, you know, what does this legislation actually do um, and, and why is it crucial for Congress to be involved? So. Um, uh, first, let me introduce our, pan our second panelist. We're going to um, start with Dr. Tess Bridgman, who is the co-editor-in-chief of Just Security and senior fellow and visiting scholar at NYU's, NYU Law's Recenter on Law and Security, where she created the War Powers Resolution Reporting Project. She has, has also served in the White House during the Obama administration as special assistant to the president, Associate Counsel to the President and Deputy Legal Advisor to the National Security Council, and also previous, previously served at the State Department. And Will Ruger currently serves as the Vice President for Foreign Policy at Stand Together and as Vice President for Research and Policy at the Charles Koch Institute. He was previously an Associate Professor at the Department of Political Science at Texas State University, um, Dr. Ruger earned his PhD in politics from Brandeis University and is a veteran of the Afghanistan war and was nominated by President Donald Trump to serve as the U.S. ambassador to the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. So turning first to Tess, um, you know, our, our uh, Stephen and Hina really clearly laid out why the reforms um, uh, in the national security reforms uh, and accountability act are needed. So what does the bill do to fix the problem that they laid out and make it harder for the U.S. to go to war? Um, and then we'll turn to, to Will and, and learn more about um, why Congress um, needs to be more involved in these decisions, given that they haven't been over the last 20 years. So Tess, turning it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Erica. And thanks so much to Demand Progress, to my, my fellow panelists here for what you've already shared in the discussion we'll have today. Uh, and thank you again to uh, Representatives McGovern and Meyer for your leadership on this, as well as uh, on the Senate side, uh, Senators Murphy, Lee and Sanders. Um, it's really encouraging to see bipartisan support for these types of reforms uh, in both chambers. So we're here today to talk about the NSRA. A, I will uh, speak, speak to what it does. Uh, in a way that also captures, for the most part, what the NSPA does on the Senate side. Um, and to jump right in, as, as Representative Meyer explained, uh, the War Powers Reform provisions of this bill 
are part of a much larger effort that tackles emergency powers and the, the president's exercise of his national security powers uh, more broadly to include things like arms export controls, uh, arms sales, uh, national emergency declarations. Um, and this part of the bill really addresses situations where the United States is getting into hostilities or situations where there's a serious risk of hostilities, where use of force uh, is, is the main issue um, at stake. And some of the, the war powers reforms uh, that are undertaken in this bill are wholesale innovations. Others just clear up some of the ambiguities uh, that Steve mentioned when he was outlining what's what's gone wrong with the current war powers framework. Um, so I'm going to touch on some of the most important ones. Um, and then maybe at the, at the very end, just get into one or two of the minor differences uh, between the two bills. Um, just, just so uh, we understand kind of what the goal is behind uh, how this new framework would operate. Uh, so the first thing that's important to highlight is that this, uh, the NSRAA and the NSPA do a better job than the current War Powers Resolution of clearly defining the limits of the president's unilateral authority to deploy the U.S. military abroad without congressional authorization. Uh, they make very clear that, that Congress does not acquiesce in the very broad executive branch view uh, of when the president can unilaterally rely on Article II authority to use force abroad. Um, and specifically, and this is important, uh, it, it gets back to, to the repel sudden attacks concept that was mentioned earlier, and that's what the framers of the Constitution had in mind, which is that the president has some residual authority, but only that residual authority, um, to use force unilaterally uh, when necessary to repel a sudden attack. And the NSRA specifically says that, that the president can use force in that situation or when there's a concrete, specific, and immediate threat of such a sudden attack on the United States, its territories, its, its armed forces, or, or other US nationals abroad. Um, and before introducing US forces in any other situation, the president must come to Congress first and ask for authorization. But importantly, even in that narrow set of circumstances that are now defined very clearly when the president uh, does have some residual authority to, to use force unilaterally, even in those situations, the president must then quickly come to Congress and ask for authorization to proceed to make sure that these um, necessary responses to an armed attack or a, a concrete and imminent threat of an armed attack don't turn into large scale engagements or wars of choice uh, without Congress having either approved or exercised its, its right to, to disapprove. Um, I think that the last thing uh, that's important to note about that definition uh, is that it really does uh, take us back uh, to a situation where Congress is in the driver's seat about when uh, force is used abroad, and there are incredibly narrow exceptions. Uh, but even, even then, Congress still comes back in and has a role to play quickly. Uh, the second thing I'll note um, is the definition of hostilities, which has been highlighted as one of the key problems that the current bill faces, the, the missing definition of hostilities. Um, there are other key terms that are defined as well in the NSRAA that are helpful, but in really in order to make the entire framework meaningful, the term hostilities is the one that absolutely has to be defined. Um, and the definition that's offered in this bill gets much closer to what Congress actually intended in 1973. Uh, and I think it was Steve who spoke a little bit about that legislative history, um, but it, it brings us much closer to what Congress intended and importantly, specifically lays out uh, not only that we're, we're talking here about all situations of the use of lethal or potentially lethal force, uh, but also it, it makes clear that there, there shouldn't be any more gamesmanship uh, with when hostilities are, are triggered by things like deploying force remotely and saying, well, um, because there's no return fire possible, uh, it can't possibly be hostilities. Um, or uh, using the cyber domain, for example, that's captured here, uh, starting and stopping the clock uh, uh, for, for termination by taking strikes kind of intermittently is another thing that the executive branch has done in many administrations. Um, that's also resolved here. So the definition includes uh, those uses of force or potentially lethal force 
irrespective of the domain, irrespective of whether that force is deployed re remotely, and uh, irrespective of the intermittency of that use of force or potentially lethal force. Um, so that's crucially important as a, as a reform for the entire framework. And in fact, if that one thing were changed, we'd already be in a much better position with respect to how Congress can exercise uh, its ability to, to use this framework. Um, but the second thing that I wanna highlight that Representative Meyer also touched on in his opening remarks is the shortening of what's currently the 60 day termination clock uh, or 90 in certain circumstances, as, as Steve reminded us. Um, the, the clock being shortened to 20 days is, is really critical and it reinforces uh, this solidified definition of hostilities and some of the other provisions that I'll get to in a minute uh, by, I, I hope, removing the temptation for, for the executive branch to start engagements that are not truly defensive in nature uh, or that balloon into escalatory conflicts, even if they started um, as a defensive use of force. Um, it's I think uh, the goal animating that that shortening is also to make sure that the executive is really incentivized to engage Congress at the front end um, and engage in far more meaningful consultation than is, is usually done now um, in order to secure support that it knows it's going to need within just a few weeks if that engagement is going to continue. Um, the fourth thing I'll highlight is the automatic, sorry, the third thing. <laughs> Uh, no, the fourth thing is the automatic funds cutoff. And this is a key enforcement mechanism that is one of the new innovations in this bill. Uh, essentially, it adds teeth back in uh, post Chata, but does flip the script in a far more meaningful way um, because the funds cutoff is automatic. So anytime that the president is using force uh, in a way that is inconsistent with this new framework uh, or after Congress uh, takes a vote uh, to, to disapprove of a presidential use of force. Um, any funds uh, are cut off. No funds can be obligated or expended for those activities um, as soon as we hit that 20-day clock and unless Congress has approved, specifically approved of uh, that use of force. No congressional vote is required, let alone a supermajority, which is, is currently needed in practice to stop the president from using force despite the intent of the 1973 resolution. Um, and it's it's backed up by the powerful Anti-Deficiency Act, which the executive branch knows uh, it, it shouldn't tangle with uh, certainly lightly. Um, and again, this incentivizes the executive branch to really come to Congress to make the decision to take the hard vote on the front end if it knows that it either has to obtain congressional authorization or cease the activity altogether within 20 days. Um, so it, it's uh, it's buttressed by that, uh, that 20 day clock um, being much shorter as well. Uh, the um, um, other couple other important features that I'll just speak to quickly, uh, the NSRAA retains and strengthens the, the fast track me mechanism for Congress to vote to disapprove of a presidential use of force. Uh, it includes much more meaningful reporting and transparency requirements. Uh, currently, uh, the War Powers Resolution requires certain activities to be reported after with, within 48 hours but then essentially lets the executive branch go silent uh, for the entire pendency of that 60 day termination period um, and thereafter up to up to six months. Um, so it's, it's difficult for Congress sometimes to get the information it needs to do its job after that initial 48 hour report. This fixes those problems and provides much more meaningful information to Congress and to the American people. Um, and finally, I'll just touch on two of the differences between the House and Senate bills that I think are worth highlighting because most are so minor. Uh, one uh, is, is sort of cosmetic, but it can cause a little bit of a hiccup when you look at the bill and read it, which is that the NSPA completely repeals and replaces the War Powers Resolution of 1973, whereas the NSRAA is styled a little differently as uh, a series of amendments to the, to the current uh, War Powers Resolution, essentially striking and adding language. Um, I would describe that as a largely cosmetic difference, uh, but it's important to note that, that the structure and framework of the two bills is largely the same. Uh, and finally, AUMF repeal. I think it's important to highlight that the House version does not repeal uh, any of the existing AUMFs, including the ones Hino was speaking to, the 2001 AUMF uh, or the 2002 AUMF that, that there's uh, currently a lot of support for getting off of the books. Um, 
the the reason for that may be simply that in the house there are other bills uh, that work towards those same ends that would repeal, uh, in fact, all of the, the force authorizations that remain on the books, 2002, 2001, 1991, 1957. Um, but it's important to note that both of the bills, the House and the Senate version, uh, contain requirements for new AUMFs that would ensure that if, if Congress does authorize any of the uh, engagements that, that presidents undertake, um, a, a set of requirements has to be met for those to constitute specific statutory authorization for war powers purposes. And that includes things like clearly defining the enemy, precluding its application to new groups unless the president comes back to Congress first, right? Sunsetting it within two years to, to ensure that each Congress takes those hard votes uh, and that our service members and the American people know that Congress is uh, is behind the deployment uh, or or has taken the hard decision to stop it. Uh, so each of each of those innovations, I think, goes a little bit to the the pathologies of the AUMFs that Hino was describing. Um, but it's also important to build directly here into the war powers framework to ensure that future force authorizations don't suffer from the same deficiencies as the 2001 AUMF and, and some of the others that are on the books now. Uh, so I'll stop there and I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks so much, Tess. That was um, an incredibly thorough and helpful um, overview of the legislation and, and all that it does to sort of strengthen the war powers uh, framework. And so now I will turn it to Will. Um, we'll zoom back out a little bit and um, focus on the issue of the imperial presidency um, to, to, to delve into why it matters that Congress really hasn't been involved enough in these decisions over the last 20 years and more. Thanks, Will. Yeah, I mean, it matters a great deal, especially for those of us who think that, you know, following the text of the Constitution and thinking about the original intent of the framers is important. We ought to, you know, not just do that on domestic policy issues, but also issues that relate to war and peace. And so I'm going to talk um, and provide some context for these discussions in terms of the original constitutional design around war powers and why this is a superior arrangement. Uh, than the failed status quo. Again, especially for those you know, that are listening who care about constitutionalism, about looking at the text, about the rule of law. So, you know, the president that's created by the constitution, and again, like, you know, this is something others have mentioned, is just a lot weaker than the one we see operating in the world today. And Congress is meant to be a lot more powerful than it has acted. Um, and so, I think we should hearken back to what one scholar has noted. He says, look, there's, quote, little in the U.S. constitutional framework that encourages executive dominance of the foreign policy making system. And yet that's what we've seen. But the framers didn't want it that way. They did not want one person to be able to make war without any check or connection to the will of the people as expressed through their representatives in Congress. And so there's both this notion that other elites need to check the president, but also that there needs to be a connection uh, to our democratic system, right? So that's an important part of the frame of, of the framing. And you know, at the Constitutional Convention, uh, Elbridge uh, Gerry, uh, famous for the gerrymandering, said he said he quote never expected to hear in a republic a motion to empower the executive alone to declare war unquote. So. That's why the front founders divided the war powers between the executive and the legislature and really gave congressional dominance in this in this fashion. And this view really flowed from the founders study of history and the dangers of executive war making, uh, you know, that they had seen and that that they see that they thought presented a real threat uh, to freedom and the good of the people. Uh, you know, to, they they worried that the president could become a quasi monarch, and they believed that monarchs, uh, as they experienced with George the Third, um, could be considered to be could be tyrannical. It also flowed from, I think, a basic pragmatism of the framers, right? Uh, this notion that there is a small R Republican wisdom, right? The, that the wisdom of the many was superior to the wisdom of the one. And I think whether you're a, a large R Republican or a big D Democrat, you can realize the virtues of that small D, uh, small R Republican or Democratic uh, notion, right? That uh, 
that having uh, the many come together uh, and deliberate and to slow the process down towards war making so that we can uh, have a kind of due consideration of the costs and benefits of the cost of the importance right of the relationship between those war the, the war making and the national interest that we could have that republican wisdom and i think that that hard work and this is something that that people have mentioned for for decades about this issue is that the hard work of actually declaring war either formally or informally would mean that that politicians leaders will have to sell the war, sell the use of force to the American public and get them on board for the sacrifices that war entails. Um, and when you when you have executive war making, there really is a disconnect. Uh, you haven't brought people along and therefore uh, they feel a lot less skin in the game for that. So even those who would favor going to war more often than, than say I as a realist would, uh, should value Congress playing a role here because it will set our country up for greater success potentially in uh, making the sacrifices necessary for a successful prosecution of a conflict. Um, you know, and, and I think that they understood too, and I mentioned this in terms of their pragmatism, that if you could go easily into war, you could more easily get into unwise conflicts or linger in ones without the kind of real oversight or checks uh, that we see. And so that's why in Article One of the Constitution, and again, it's passe to refer to the actual constitutional uh, text when we think about uh, you know, what powers government should have, you know, right, Congress is meant to declare war either informally or formally. And, and even people like Hamilton complained that there, you know, the formal use of declarations had fallen out of favor, you know, 250 years ago, right? Um, but the, the notion that there should be at least an informal way in which Congress expresses its authorities. You know, it should raise and support armies, maintain navies, call up and organize and arm the militia, regulate the military, and budget for war. And that's a, another area where Congress can assert itself is using the power of the purse. Uh, you know, whereas the presidential war making was extremely limited, right? The founders wanted it that way. And so that the Constitutional Convention uh, delegate Roger Sherman, uh, a fan of many conservatives, he argued that the president, quote, should be able to repel and not to commence war. So they were quite clear about this. And so the, the president is really only empowered to independently repel attacks. So to fight purely defensive wars that required fast action, like if the country were invaded. Uh, and to be the commander in chief to lead the military if Congress declared war, but not to go to war on his or her own. And the problem is that we've gotten away from that, right? Uh, that constitutional de design is not the way of that Americans make war today. And again, Congress has been uh, relatively unwilling to play its constitutional role. And I really appreciated what Representative McGovern said about the incentives and, and really the lack of courage that we've seen in Congress. So Congress is one of the uh, bodies itself that needs to make Congress great again. Uh, and as, as, as Steve talked about, there are many examples where, where uh, we've seen executive war making, whether it's Truman in Korea or the tanker wars or Lebanon, or I think uh, an underrated debacle, which was the Libyan conflict. Now, of course, one thing we have to remember is that Congress playing its proper role in our system doesn't guarantee wise policy. But at least it gives us a fighting chance because, again, of that small R Republican or small D Democratic wisdom here uh, of involving the people's representatives, of having deliberation and really weighing the costs and benefits without a rush to conflict. And for those that are concerned about, well, will we be able to defend our national interests in, in a way that we need to if attacked? The Constitution gives the president the power to repel attacks in purely defensive wars. And so it's a red herring to say that, well, if we have to wait for Congress to assemble, that we, you know, we could really suffer. Uh, no, I mean, in, in, in what we're talking about here is, is our wars that, especially in the post-Cold War era, have been wars of choice in which, um, you know, we had the time to declare war when it came to Iraq uh, or to provide an, right, in terms of the of 2002 AUMF or the 2001 AUMF, right, even though we would have been attacked. So we can certainly wait when it comes to those wars where we're not repelling attack and allow Congress to play its role. And I'm a believer that if something are tr is truly in the national interest 
absolutely necessary for our security or the conditions of our prosperity, that Congress will play its proper role. And so there's nothing that's a problem in adding Congress back into the constitutional mix consistent with the original design. And I think especially, I mean, one of the things that's great about this coalition for war powers reform is that it is bipartisan or even transpartisan. And I think one of the things that that I think about as someone uh, you know, on the conservative side is, is this notion that we care about a constitutional design and conservatives are always banging on about this, right? And, and so they ought to remember that it's important in foreign policy, just as it is, is in domestic policy, to think about the text of the constitution and the original intent of the framers. Uh, and it's hypocritical not to, to think about those things in foreign policy when talking so much about that when it comes to other matters that relate to, to kind of the limited government and constitutionalism. So thank you, Erica. And I, I thought that was a great question. Great, thank you so much. Uh, again, Tess and, and, and Will, um, I think we have a much better understanding of why um, Congress being involved in these decisions will help uh, get us out of the um, awful framework that we are currently in. So we're going to now turn to all of the panelists and um, open it up for a question and answer. I am going to take the moderator's prerogative um, and ask the first question, and then we will um, further turn to audience, audience Q&A. But um, with that, uh, the, the question is, um, if these reforms are enacted, how do you see their implications for conflict prevention, democratic accountability, um, and U.S. foreign policy more broadly? I know that that's really been touched on in a number of your opening remarks, but if anyone wants to take this and, and further run with it, um, just, you know, want to know what, how, how this bill will, will affect broader U.S. foreign policy. I'll take the first crack if you like, Erica, um, very briefly, because I think it's really all been said. I think Will you know, made the really important point that you can't guarantee that um, simply requiring uh, authorization more rigorously is going to make for 100 percent better foreign policy decisions. I mean, some of the most imprudent wars that the United States has launched in the last 60 years have been wholly or partially authorized by Congress. But a lot of them haven't. <laughs> so um, uh, you'd have, I, I think if you look back at the record and think about some of the wars that the United States has entered into and whether there would have been congressional support for them, I think you can make a very strong case that some of those wars would not have been authorized and, and, and we would have avoided imprudent wars that actually damaged US national interests and certainly did a lot of damage on the ground where the United States was acting. I think that's point number one. Um, I think um, the the provisions that Tess was talking about, you know, the guidance for future statutory authorizations are really important because they create, I think, a better framework for let's call it authorization hygiene going forward. The idea that Congress is going to have to come back every two years and face what it did two years ago, I think, is a really powerful mechanism for making people think twice before they authorize the war machine to kick into gear. Right now, we live in a world where Congress authorizes something and 20 years pass. That's what's literally happened with the 2001 AUMF. 20 years pass. The executive branch has interpreted it, stretched it. Um, but Congress has never really had to come back and face a, a difficult vote on that. I think a two-year interval is just about right. It would mean that everybody who enters the US Congress at some point is gonna have to have skin in the game for every conflict the United States is engaged in. And then the last point, and this is again, sort of echoing, I think, points Will made on the democratic accountability um, or democratic theory behind war. I think it has two dimensions to it. One, um, we're, and Hina mentioned this too, we're asking troops to do some, some really difficult things when they go to war, put their lives on the line, take other people's lives. They deserve to know that the entire <laughs> political apparatus of the US government, both political branches of the government are standing behind them if they are being put in those positions. That's point number one. Point number two, I think it's really dangerous for the United States to be conducting foreign policy where it's being decided by a bunch of unelected officials in the executive branch. 
Um, and people outside, you know, the Beltway don't understand, you know, these different, I, I worked in there. I'm not sure I fully understand sometimes all the different conventions by which the executive branch logics its way to its more powers. I don't think that's a healthy situation. I think it's an unhealthy disconnect. I think this bill would unite um, popular sentiment and decisions to go to war in a way that would actually make us stronger as a democracy. Yeah, if I could, if I could add something, I mean, it should be harder to go to war than to get out of wars. And unfortunately, you've seen in Congress a, a stronger antipathy to, to getting out of wars that, say, presidents want to. Uh, you saw congressional his hostility to some of President Trump's attempts to uh, reduce our involvement in these forever wars. Um, and yet getting into them seems so easy. Uh, and, and again, it, it's just not consistent with the constitutional design. But even more importantly, perhaps, it's just not pragmatic. I just to add one, one thing that I think is in another lesson of the last few years, which is one of the ways in which oversight has not worked and been broken is um, so many of the things that we hear from people in impacted countries, right? Um, the ways in which um, uh, people in Afghanistan have been calling out what perpetual war has meant to them, uh, a lack of accountability, um, what's happened in, in Yemen. And so for me, one of the, you know, everyone's, we've all been talking about the many benefits, but the, the power of debate and reflection and being able to incorporate a variety of views, not just what um, members of Congress might be told, including especially in closed session, but a variety of views from people who are specialists in conflict prevention, in diplomatic and humanitarian responses, in human and strategic costs and consequences. We've lost the muscle memory for having those kinds of discussions to assess human, legal, and strategic costs. And that's a huge part, I think, of what, what we need to restore. I'll just, yeah, I'll add one quick uh, point, which is really just to underscore something that Representative McGovern started us off with. And I think it boils down to, if you have the courage to deploy, I have the courage to vote. Uh, that's that's what members of Congress would, would be saying by adopting this legislation. Because right now, uh, it's very easy, as he was saying, for, for members to sit back and let the executive branch make the hard decisions, let the president decide when to go to war, how much force to use, when to stop uh, a deployment, when to end a war. Those are not questions that Congress has been uh, taking it upon itself to decide despite the constitution putting that squarely in Congress's hands. Uh, and this flips the script so fundamentally by ensuring that for the, the vast majority of, of the missions undertaken, whether they're humanitarian missions in nature, whether they're assistance to, to partner forces, uh, or whether they are truly uh, defensive in nature, uh, that Congress comes in and has to take that hard vote uh, and that if no vote is taken, that the that the the deployment does terminate automatically without another vote uh, needing needing to be taken. Uh, so that I think is is just a fundamental flipping of the script uh, that that makes democratic accountability the centerpiece rather than an afterthought in decisions about whether to go to war and and how to end a war. Great, thank you all for that. Um, let's stay on the on the question of Yemen because it's it's. Um, come up a number of times here. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge reason why we have this legislation now. Um, the U.S. military's complicity in the Yemen war over the last five years is one of the clearest examples of the way the U.S. has been waging war in secret, without explicit authorization from Congress, and, um, and as, as Hina rightly just pointed out, you know, with no public debate. And today, the U.S. supported Saudi and Emirati-led intervention against the Houthis in Yemen has resulted in an unmitigated humanitarian disaster. We've gotten a number of questions on this um, issue, including from Yemeni Americans, um, from Keen Bhatt, who um, is the foreign policy director at the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Um, and so I'm going to try and, you know, batch them into, you know, a one um, overarching question or, or several overarching questions. So could you, um, could, could all of you explain um, what this legislation means for current attempts to end U.S. involvement in the war? Um, 
and how it was informed by Congress's efforts to legislate on Yemen over the last few years. And how would the legislation make sure that another Yemen um, does not happen again? Does anyone want to want to go first? Uh, out of tradition, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll do it one more time. Um, so it's interesting, actually. The, I think the first time International Crisis Group came out and recommended war powers reform was in the context of a report that we wrote um, called Ending the Yemen Quagmire. And it was about it was about how the United States became involved in Yemen, became complicit uh, in this tragic, unnecessary war, at least from the United States perspective, um, and why it had failed to extricate itself. And one of the recommendations at the back of that report was that uh, it was important to reform war powers legislation so that um, that future, uh, in future situations, like the US found itself in in 2015, Congress would have to take an up or down vote on whether or not the United States went ahead and joined that conflict. And not only that, but for the reasons we were just discussing under this new legislation, every two years, it would have to come back again and revisit whether or not um, it had take, you know, whether it was gonna reauthorize uh, US engagement. And I think that in that context, the reauthorization issue is really important because um, back in 2015, people may not remember this, but I think that there was actually a lot of pressure on the administration to do more uh, in Yemen, um, awful as that now uh, looks and sounds and is. Um, I'm not sure Congress would have voted against that authorization back in 2015. But in 2017, it might have. In 2019, it surely would have. Um, and so I think, you know, it really heightens the importance of having reauthorization requirements in future authorizations for the use of military force. Thanks, Steve. Anyone else uh, want to answer that question? Tess? I can jump in with uh, a few brief thoughts. One is that I think there are a number of different avenues for uh, trying to ensure that the United States is extracted from participation in the Saudi-led coalition. Um, one of which uh, being advanced by uh, Representative Connor right now, an amendment that I think uh, passed the House and is, is being considered as part of the NDAA, um, uh, would be extremely effective, I think, in, in ending the types of engagement that the U.S. is, is seems to currently be involved in um, without using the war powers resolution, but using other mechanisms. Uh, you know, we've we've spoken for years in, in, in various contexts about the need to cut off arms sales to have more accountability for how U.S. provided uh, weapons and munitions are used um, and to, to, you know, use the levers that Congress has to ensure that those types of activities that do fall short of hostilities are still ones that Congress can have oversight over uh, and can can pull the executive branch out of if it disagrees. Um, that's the kind of thing uh, as well, just to, to kind of zoom out and, and think more broadly, that other parts of the NSRAA intend to do, right? So in, in reforming uh, arms exports, um, addressing the Arms Export Control Act, um, that's certainly one of the, one of the targets of, of those reforms. Um, so I think these efforts are mutually consistent and reinforcing. Uh, and the, you know, as Steve was just mentioning, the the impetus behind uh, the NSRAA broadly is to address exactly situations like the one that that the United States ended up being in in Yemen, um, but also a, a whole range of other. Um, you know, conflicts that are through partner or proxy forces uh, that Congress also hasn't been speaking to, uh, and those are addressed in this legislation as well. Um, so I think it's important to put that larger context uh, in, in um, you know, in the front of our minds as we think about uh, the whole range of tools that Congress has available to uh, to rein in presidential war making, but also other types of uh, you know, national security activities that may fall short of war, but nevertheless, uh, that Congress should have, uh, should have a deciding vote on uh, and should certainly be exercising meaningful oversight on. I think Steve and, and Tess have really laid out very powerfully, you know, both the cutoff mechanisms as well as the overarching package. And I, it feels really important to emphasize that the, the first sort of U.S. strike in, in Yemen took place in 2002 uh, under President Bush. 
So this goes a long way back. And I remember thinking at the time, why aren't people more outraged? This is, you know, an extrajudicial strike. Um, and then exacerbated under President Obama. So there's a long history of US engagement, including now, you know, including then support for the Saudi regime. And, and what seems really important in addition to the, to the efforts, the very, very necessary efforts to bring an end to what's, you know, the tragedy and humanitarian uh, consequences of what's happening in Yemen is, is the second part of that question, Erica, which is how to prevent it ever from happening again. And I sort of, A, you know, those kinds of strikes would not have been permitted or there would have been cutoff mechanisms, there would have been requirements for um, pauses and breaks. But a thing that I constantly think about from, you know, Yemeni human rights groups that we work with and hear from and support is that they're, it's not breaking through the consequences of US actions themselves and getting better transparency and better debate. So I wanna just return back to the fundamental point of being able to incorporate perspectives that talk about what the consequences would be. And often those perspectives are most importantly from the people in the countries that are impacted. Um, and we don't do enough of that in our country uh, to think about what those consequences are and to ask those questions and views. And, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that this helps rejuvenate that to a very important degree. Thank you, Hannah, uh, and thank you all. And um, let's let's stay on the on the question of, of um, one of the really important mechanisms in the legislation to um, end conflict before it gets out of control. Um, and I think this might be a question for test answer first. Um, it comes from a, sta a congressional staffer, and they ask, "How would the automatic funding cutoff be enforced in practice? What if the president disputes Congress's claims of?" Uh, U.S. involvement in hostilities? What's the legal recourse? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, I'll give a couple part answer, and one of which I'll pivot to Hina on, which is the judicial review uh, provisions, which are intended to give Congress recourse if the president does not comply. Um, but just backing up, one of the key things that I think is really helpful about this legislation is that it makes it a lot harder for the executive branch to argue around the, the language of the statute by defining the key terms. So the term hostilities, the term introduce, uh, even the terms combat enlarged, uh, sorry, combat equipped and substantially enlarged, all of these kinds of terms of art that the executive branch has been defining over the years uh, without Congress weighing in, those are made very clear here, uh, which, which makes it a lot harder for the president to dodge. Um, second, um, and this is something that I alluded to briefly uh, when I laid out um, the, the key provisions that we discussed earlier, uh, the Anti-Deficiency Act, uh, which is already on the books and is well known to every executive branch lawyer, um, is kind of a really powerful backstop to funds cutoffs, uh, essentially imposing liability if funds are expended or obligated uh, in a way that Congress hasn't approved of is the shorthand way to describe that. Um, and that's something that um, you know doesn't need to be written into this law. It already exists um, and is a, is a backstop for any funding cutoff mechanism. Uh, and I think then another thing that I would I would note is that because of these shortened time frames, because of the increased reporting requirements, Congress should hopefully have a lot more robust engagement in the course of uh, the president taking these actions and, and Congress responding, right? It should have more information about what's going on. Uh, there's a certification required by the president as to whether uh, the activities are continuing or whether they have ended already. Uh, various of these provisions are intended to ensure uh, that, the, that the president um, doesn't act in a way that's as opaque and kind of murky uh, as, as is, is currently usual practice. Uh, so that conversation about are we still in hostilities? When did they commence? Uh, you know, did their reporting give us enough information to determine whether or not that funds cutoff should kick in? Um, you know, does it constitute hostilities, even though the strikes may appear to be intermittent or even though they were launched, you know, using ones and zeros through cyber means, you know, all of those questions are answered here. Um, and that should make it, uh, you know, much more definite and concrete when Congress comes back and says, I know that funding cutoff has has kicked in. Um, 
but I'll, I'll see if any of my fellow panelists want to either add to that or, or speak to the judicial review provisions specifically. Anyone? Can I speak a little bit to the judicial review provision? Um, and, you know, I think, well, a couple of things. So there, there was a 2019 Supreme Court case called Bethune Hill, um, which involved um, Virginia state agencies and election officials. And the question essentially was, you know, um, what is legislative standing and authority to be able to sue? And I think what Bethune Hill, which is sort of a very unique and sort of strange case, um, left clear is that statutes can uh, designate proper agents to represent uh, government interests in federal courts. Um, and in some instances, legislatures as a whole would likely have standing to represent collective institutional interests in federal court. And in likely all circumstances, single chambers in bicameral legislatures might lack standing. So part of what the NSPA provision aims to do um, in my understanding of the of the legend of the drafters intent is to address those murky areas in the law in order to be able to ensure um, uh, article three standing um, to challenge a violation in court and if anyone wants to discuss Bethune Hill afterwards you know, we can certainly set up a time to do that. <laughs> Still trying to figure much of it out. Thanks, Anna. Um, we, I just want to do a time check for the audience and for the panelists. We have about nine minutes left. And so we'll probably get to one or two more questions, but also think about any points that you want to make that um, I may not ask you on behalf of the, the audience. Um, so we do have a, another question, which I think has been addressed somewhat, but um, from a staffer who's interested to know how the NSRAA and the NSPA would be applied to unauthorized strikes or strikes with, with shaky legal justification. So for example, drone strikes outside of war zones, the Syria strikes, um, potentially the you know assassination of Qasem Soleimani, um, things that it seemed to be more one-off. I mean, one, one of the problems is that Congress has a lot of blunt instruments at, at its, uh, you know, in its toolbox, right? So for something like that, I mean, there are constitutional remedies, but they're remedies that are, are probably not all that helpful, like impeachment is a remedy, but are we going to really impeach a president over a one-off strike? Um, so I, I think it's very challenging. But I did want to make a, a, a broader point while I have the floor here that I, I, I don't think we've made yet. But I'm all for these institutional uh, changes. I think institutions matter greatly in impacting outcomes in, in politics. Um, so I don't want to denigrate that view. And I'm very supportive of all these efforts uh, that um, we're seeing right now in Congress. Um, but I would say too that our constitutional system does rely on a certain amount of virtue uh, in our leaders, particularly in the executive branch. And, you know, I was sort of hopeful that we would see some of that constitutional virtue from uh, President Obama, given the things that he had said when he was in Congress. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't see that with Libya. Uh, but I do think that 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 I, you know, perhaps President Biden would exercise some of this, given his long history uh, up the street from where he is now. And uh, regardless of, of either of these two presidents, I mean, I, I think that this is the kind of thing that we should, you know, demand uh, when we're, when, especially when we're talking about elections and campaigns, it would be great to see more questions about, you know, how presidents think about their role in a constitutional system in which these powers uh, are largely with Congress. And, and I think it would be, you know, and again, people don't generally vote on foreign policy to the extent to which they vote on other issues. But I still think that that uh, the media and think tankers, you know, should be asking these questions about about presidents and presidential candidates. You know, how do they think about our constitutional system? Because it will give us some 
sense of what their views are, as well as you know any sense of kind of moderation in terms of their ability to know the best solution for our foreign policies, as opposed to seeking that that uh, democratic wisdom. So. I think it's just important that we have the institutional checks and that we we try to have some accountability and and some sense of uh, about what kind of constitutional virtues our leaders have. Uh, again, as, especially because what the, what the congressman mentioned before, it's also virtue in the in, on Capitol Hill, the kind of courage uh, that you would like to see uh, from congressmen and women who will take hard votes, not because they like to, but because it's part of their job and it's. And it's what uh, I think Steve put it right. It's what we should expect for people who are going to ask sailors, Marines, airmen, and soldiers, uh, you know, who are going to be, ha- we're demanding them to, to have courage. We should have some courage here back home. Absolutely. And with uh, five minutes left, let's just do an around the horn. Um, folks want to respond to each other, or provide some concluding remarks. Um, Hina Isa, you might want to go next. Sure, I was going to respond to the question about the strikes and maybe I'll make that my concluding um, remark, which is that, um, you know, in our view, um, those strikes are not lawful. They're not authorized. This is not what Congress intended uh, when it authorized the 2001 UMF. And it is in the power of the president to bring an end to the program, right? We've been joined by 113 groups domestically and around the world who have called for an end to the program and the human rights costs and consequences of it. At the same time, we're seeing media reports that even despite the withdrawal from Afghanistan, that program might be poised to continue, that there's a counterterrorism review, it's unclear what the program will or won't be. And so a couple of thoughts on that. One is that with this legislation and the um, stop, consider, deliberate mechanisms it has, but also very, very importantly, the definitions of hostilities um, and and other definitions that are in, in the legislation, the kinds of arguments that lawyers within the executive branch might be making or have made to justify the lethal strikes program um, are going to be harder, if not impossible, to make. That also said, um, you know, it, the executive can and should stop that program now. Um, and if that doesn't happen, this is all the more impetus to support legislation that prevents anything like this from from happening uh, again. Eric, I'm happy to jump in. Um, And I just, I'm gonna be building on what my uh, co-panelists have very eloquently said and and partly answer an earlier question. Um, There is no real way to build an airtight system Um, that will guarantee that the president never launches an imprudent war without congressional authorization. Um, But what, and and I I actually could not agree more with Will's point about virtue and needing our elected officials to be their best selves in representing the American people when they're in office. But right now, and for the last several decades, we've been in a negative spiral. the sort of way in which our institutions have acted and the way in which the law has evolved has expanded presidential powers in a way that I think is unhealthy from the perspective of conflict prevention and the perspective of democratic accountability. And I think what this piece of legislation would do, and I really think both the Senate and the House bills are are absolutely first rate from this perspective, is to reverse that trend. And they collect some of the barely best ideas that have come together over the last you know, several decades in terms of how to make, how to empower Congress, how to place enforcement mechanisms right squarely within Congress's wheelhouse. For example, the funds cut off. That really is a very nice way of locating the enforcement mechanism at the core of the Congress is constitutional powers. These are really good ideas. They're the best that have, you know, I think that have been come up with over the decades in terms of, of empowering Congress and writing this ship. And, and, you know, I think they create some expectations to the question about how do you end up, how do you stop a one-off strike? You might not be able to stop it, 
but you're creating a set of expectations out there, as Hina was saying, that make it much more difficult for the executive branch to come out and justify it and say this was a lawful thing to do. And that will hopefully, for that reason, incur greater political costs as a result. So again, you can't make a perfect, I don't think you can build a perfect mousetrap, but this is a very good mousetrap. And I think it makes the costs of continuing the spiral in the negative direction much higher um, and creates a really decent chance that you create a more positive spiral in the right direction now. Well, I'll be uh, incredibly brief just to build on what my co-panelists have said, recognizing our time is up. Um, and I'll, I'll do it in just, I think, one sentence. Um, we can't count on the executive branch to start policing itself. We've seen it's not going to do that, but we also can't count on Congress to start deciding to show up to take the hard votes unless it forces itself to do that. And that's what this bill does, is it forces the executive branch to take Congress's role more seriously, and it forces Congress to take Congress's role more seriously. Uh, and that's why uh, if it does succeed, uh, it would fundamentally flip the script and allow for more democratic accountability on these issues of war and peace. So, uh, you know, ag agree that that tweaks can be made. It's not the, the perfect, uh, but it is by far the best solution that we've seen to date. And I, I want to thank the members for their leadership uh, in, in moving it forward. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all of you for your really excellent remarks. I, I personally have learned a lot today. Um, I will also say that I am leaving this discussion more optimistic than when I started it, because I think that we're really in a place where um, there are a lot of people coming together that want to uh, take reforms and, um, you know, in, on a bipartisan and transpartisan basis. Let me also thank Demand Progress um, for hosting us once again. They um, will be having two more webinars of this nature. Um, so keep an eye out for parts two and three on emergency, on, on arms sales and emergency powers. And with that, uh, thanks again. And I think we will close it out.